us, Father. Let's thank God for the champion of this movement, our bishop. Amen. Amen. We were talking on Friday night because there's so much language that we use in the Orthodox Church that is largely unknown to evangelicals, and it's important that we know not just what we're saying, but why we're saying what we're saying. Most of us were raised in an environment where the chief act of worship was preaching. The chief act, the chief end of worship was preaching, and that's such a limited perception because preaching was not necessary until the fall of man. See, worship preceded the fall of man, but once man fell, preaching had to start. Oh, I hope some, I hope my, some of my Pentecostal brothers are tuning in this morning. Sometimes you get GQ, you know, with me. Sometimes you're going to get DQ. Amen? And then sometimes you're going to get BBQ. I, th- I think this morning we're going to work toward GQ. Amen? Let's thank God. Let's thank God for a little bit of elevation this morning. And hopefully one or two things I say will be able to bless you and convince you that that uh, just hearing the preaching of the word is one level of experiencing God. Now, I'm not discounting that there are great preachers. We stand in the midst of one of the greatest preachers in the world, our bishop. Amen? Amen. I had a chance I had a chance to drive another great preacher. You guys know I was a driver during our conferences. Was anybody here during our conference days back when we were, I mean, we were prepping olives and drinks and cheese and meats and all that. I mean, we had all kinds of famous people flying in. Here I am, a little country boy driving these people around. They're using language I'd never heard before in my life. Amen? But I was privileged to be the driver. I was thanking God I was just in the car. Amen? I didn't even have to have a conversation. I was just happy to be there. Anybody ever just have a happy to be there moment? I don't have to have a dialogue. I just want to listen in. Amen? So the great preacher I was driving was Archbishop Veron Ash, and uh, how many of you guys have heard of him? He's an amazing man of God. He's passed away. January 2014, he passed away. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, we recall him to mind right now, um, but I thank God for great preachers. But preaching cannot be the chief end of worship, because if, preach, if preaching is the chief end of worship, when the preacher, di- or when the preacher dies, the worship dies. Most of us are following someone because we like their preaching style. We like their, their mannerisms. We like the way that they communicate the gospel. We feel, rela- we feel related and connected to them. But great preachers last one to two generations at most. We're talking about 2,000 years of history and cultures that span with all different types of experiences. Amen? So the chief act of worship has to be the Holy Eucharist. Amen? The chief act of worship, as beautiful as Jada's voice is, and I missed her this morning. Jada, we missed you so much, and Deaconess Francis and Troy. As beautiful as their voices are, the chief chief act of worship cannot be song. Because the chief, if the chief act of worship is song, if we don't have any singers or instruments, we ain't worshiping. Amen? I said ain't, Grandma. We ain't worshiping. So the chief act of worship, according to the church fathers, is the Holy Eucharist. Because in the Holy Eucharist, our Lord is articulated in a way that he can be consumed and represented all around the world as himself serving a world that needs him to be serving them. Amen? Amen. We got a long gospel this morning, so hope you're ready. Hope you had an extra shot of espresso. This is a two pages here. Amen. So let's go. Let's work through it, though. It's a great story. So um, this is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you guys may notice at the reading of the Holy Gospel, I will often make a cross on my forehead because my mind needs a little bit of help to process what's coming. You see, everybody that enters an Orthodox church, an Orthocostal church, they're going to be interpreting data. This altar is data. That icon is data. The question is, what server are we using to interpret the data? Oh, Father, we might get in some, just a little bit of trouble, but if you brought a PC and we're talking Apple, you're going to be in trouble this morning. You got to right, bring the right processor, the right server, and then when you have a server, it's going to get an upgrade. 
Amen. Some of us are still working on 2.0, and we've already passed on to 6.0. So I anoint my mind when, when the gospel is read because my mind is where I need the most help. Anybody with me in that? Is that where you need the most help is in your mind? There's a battlefield happening right between your ears. And the battle may not even happen during the preaching because the preaching is a little bit like honey. But when you walk away from here and life punches you in the face like the Vols did yesterday to Duke. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. See, life will punch you in the face. <laughs> I knew Alex would laugh at that one. He's a, my Vol brother over there. Amen. Amen. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. So hang in there. Listen to the story. Listen to the rhythm of the story. Don't listen to the voice of the preacher. Because, I mean, you could, be, you could be linked into me, but miss the message. Amen? I may not be here next week. Father may not be here next week. The question is, how, how far is this church going to outlast the preacher? Amen. We're all, we're all looking tired and swiveling around, so I'm going to read fast. Amen? Here we go. Jesus saw a blind man from his birth. Everybody say blind. Say it like, like you don't want to be it. Blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Now, we could go into a whole teaching on what it means to become a rabbi, because in the Jewish culture, we, we have no idea in our culture what it means to become a rabbi. It is a complicated process. By the time a youth in the nation of Israel reached the age of 10 years old, they had already memorized the first five books of the Bible. I said by the time they're 10, they had memorized the first five books of the Bible. By the time they were 15, they had memorized the entire Old Testament as they knew it. That was standard protocol for all Jewish young people. Now the cream of the crop, those who not only memorized it but lived it, may have been selected to be a disciple of a rabbi. So that when we're talking about the rabbi here, where his disciples are saying... This man, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Listen, Father was, say, Father was saying this earlier, night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. you got to love John. John using this motif of light. It's such an amazing way he, he layers this. I am the light of the world. As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Salawam, which means scent. Everybody say scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Boy, isn't that a good story? Never seen in his life. It's a good story for us. But the problem is if you've never seen in your life, and now all of a sudden you can see the way you've learned to live no longer works for you. This man had worked based on having supersonic sound and supersonic smell. Because when, when your sight goes away or you never have it, the other senses step up and they ramp up so that you can still read the world and interpret the world, just not using sight. So in some ways, this made his world more complicated. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? There's people that will only judge you by your history. Amen? They'll only judge you by your rap sheet. That's what they were saying. Isn't this, isn't this you? You should be sitting and begging all the time. Some, some said, Is it he? Others said, no, but he is like him. He said, I am the man. Look at your neighbor say, I am the man. Look at him again and say it like you mean it. I am the man. And the, the church fathers translate this, not just I am the man, like it, this, is, this really is me. The church fathers translate it as he said, I am that I am. So not only had his vision been transformed, he was transformed. They said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He, he answered, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. 
and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he, this Jesus you're talking about? He said, I don't know. What the man didn't know was Jesus was talking to those people through him. Amen? They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day, and when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, the Pharisees asked again, asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents. Now they're calling in for witnesses. His word wasn't enough. The fact that he can see wasn't enough. Now they're calling in his parents. And they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then, does he, how then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, I, I, I can't preach his theology. I can't speak all the fancy language. I can't tell the story the way he tells the stories. But one thing I know is now I can see. Oh, my goodness. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> this is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Happy are those who hear these words, who believe them, and who obey them. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning that we have not come to drink the milk of your word, but Father, you have promised to feed us the meat of your word. For Lord, we don't want to stay babes. Help us to mature and become just like you. I pray now for every hearer, those that hear this live over Facebook, Lord, or whatever venue they're, they're watching and listening, and those in the house this morning, as well as those who will watch this over replay, Father. We pray that that sentimentality would be, put, would be set aside and that we would have the courage to prioritize the things you prioritize. To put away the things we desire during worship and to embrace the things you've called us to have during worship. And Lord, help us, Lord, to see past just the voice of the speaker and to see and hear you speaking and ministering to your people. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated, beloved. I'm going to speak to you for a few moments. We have about... 21 minutes this morning, but who's timing? Amen. I'm going to speak to you for a few moments on the idea of recovering the family recipe. Look at your neighbor and say, we got to get our recipe back.
You see, John does a wonderful job of using light layered throughout his gospel, and John tells us details that other gospel writers do not tell us, so we have to listen to every single detail John uses because it helps us to grasp things that we may not have seen otherwise. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. John begins his entire gospel by telling you who he's going to be talking about the entire time. John is not in the business of telling everybody's story. He's in the business of telling one person's story. Amen? And so he says, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The thing about light is you can't see light. Light's complicated. You can only see what light's bouncing off of. Amen? Right now, we're not seeing beams of light hit Avery or, you know, hit Grable. We're seeing what light is reflecting off of. So light can be complicated, but... You know, light is necessary because without light, we, we, are, we lose the ability to see. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Judas leaving the, left the Last Supper at night. The disciples were fishing at night and caught nothing. The play of light and darkness is key in John's gospel. And if you look around right now, there are two types of light that we are all experiencing at the same time. There is created light. Created light are the lights beaming in my eyes right now. They're the lights shining down from the bulbs. When you go to buy a 20, 30, 40, 50 watt bulb, you're buying, you're buying, you're buying that type of light. Amen? And then there's uncreated light. Look at your neighbor say uncreated light. Uncreated light is the light that existed before what we know as light was. Uncreated light is not a part of creation. Uncreated light is a person. Amen? Uncreated light, I'm going to say it one more time because you're so excited I can tell. Uncreated light is not a, not a manifestation of the wisdom of Thomas Edison. Uncreated light is the light that existed before there was even darkness. Because the greatest thing God ever created was not light. He didn't create light. He introduced himself to what he created before he could introduce himself, which was darkness. The first thing ever created was not light. It was darkness. Because God had to have a beginning point. Amen? He had to have a starting place. In this text, light is equal with sight. The ability to see and the ability to understand. Sight for the blind man can be a metaphor for spiritual vision for us. The reality is we're all this blind man. We're all this blind man. We should all be able to easily relate to his condition of not being able to see since birth. For we are born blind to the kingdom of God. Our blindness isn't a result of poor choices. It's not a result of social conditioning, Vlad. Our blindness is because we're born into a world where the current is anti-divine. It's anti-divine nature. And birth is actually death to the unlimited perception we all had prior to taking on physical matter. I'm going to slow down and say that one more time because I had some sling in there. Birth is death to the unlimited perception we all had prior to taking on physical matter. We should be having funerals at birth, not celebrations. We evaluate situations and circumstances from a dark perspective. Jesus invites us to evaluate things from a, from a perspective of light. Now, this story is wonderful because as the proximity between Jesus and this man decreases, proximity means the space between them. As it shortens, the man wasn't asking for a miracle. The man had no desire necessarily to go to church or to know who God was. And after the miracle, they asked him who he was, and he says, I still don't know who he is, but I know I can see. The proximity, as it decreased, the man became a more likely suspect for the miracles of God to go on display. Just by showing up this morning, your proximity to the Savior has decreased, and you're, you're now a candidate for a miracle in a way that you wouldn't have been had you not showed up. 
Jesus represents an apostolic movement that will not walk past the marginalized. He had three main offices, and these are wonderful. And Martin, if you're taking notes, it's good to write these down. Jesus was the priest, prophet, and king. Now, as this man walked by, his heart, I mean, as Jesus walked by, his heart turned toward this man, and the man doesn't experience Jesus, the prophet. The man doesn't need a word from God. The man doesn't experience Jesus, the king. The man couldn't see a king if he had to. The man needs Jesus, the priest. Amen? So his heart turns toward the man, and Jesus says, I have a solution. Look at your neighbor and say, I have a solution. Whenever there's an apostolic movement, which I think is the ultimate correction for the church, the first thing that's corrected is poor vocabulary. Poor vocabulary. New words are introduced. The native tongue of heaven is reintroduced. Friday night we were talking about different parts of the language in the holy liturgy and some of our prayers. And there's the word kitty eleison. Look at your neighbor and try and say that. Kitty eleison. Lord have mercy. Now that, they're, they're using that over in the Baptist church, aren't they? God bless our Baptist brothers. They're using that over in the church of God, right? Kitty eleison means Lord have mercy. Badagmor. Look at your neighbor and say badagmor. Bless Lord. Mar being Lord. Barak, bless. Amin, amin, amin. Amin. A fancy way of saying amen. An important one that many of us may not know is ego, I me. Look at your neighbor and say, ego, I me. Ego, I me is I am. After identifying himself as light, Jesus kneels down. St. Augustine says the spittle of Jesus, which comes from his head and from his mouth, divine things are often dealing with the head and with the mouth. It represents his divinity. He takes the spit out of his mouth and he mixes it with the dirt, which is a representation of humanity. And when the two come together, we get a special healing salve that can only be created from divine and earthly things coming together and being mixed together. Think of this mud as a healing balm. It's the closest thing we have to sal- salve in Latin. The, the word is salve. Look at your neighbor and say salve. Salve means health. And so when, you, when, when the early church, when the early Christians would greet one another, they'd say salve, health be to you, Grable. Salve, Father Phil, health be to you. That was common language for the early Christians. And so the Lord, he made this salve or he made this salve to put on the eyes of the blind man. Jesus himself is the mud. The mystery is we think he's all spit. Oh, I didn't know I was going to use spit twice, Alex. We might be in trouble. Amen? (laughs) See, we think Jesus is all his his own DNA. And we we think we're just the dirt and the mud. But as our Father has preached and taught us, you're not dirt, you are divine. Amen? There's some Jesus in the dirty part of this message. And this is where the sacraments of the church uh, complicate things for people who think that preaching is the, the single primary consequence of worship. Because the sacraments of the church require matter. Look at your neighbor and say, matter matters. Uh, the church is heavy on form, we're heavy on preaching, we're heavy on telling people what they should be doing, and we're short on the matter of proving exactly what we should be doing and showing everybody. We can have a whole lot of form and have not a lot of matter. Most, most Protestant churches have very little matter because they're not using things that Thomas Aquinas taught us were very important for worship. Matter involves wax for candles, cloth for the wick, salt for the ashes for Ash Wednesday, oil for the chrismation and for anointing the dying and the dead. Bread that is gathered from the four winds together and made one. Wine that is derived from thousands of individual grapes simultaneously pressed and squeezed so the juice can begin to flow. Where's your matter? 
Matter matters. Are you taking the mat? Can you are you eating him every Sunday? Or are you just thinking about him? Oh man, I could think. You know, we could think about some. You could think about driving a Lamborghini all day long. It's different than getting on I twenty five driving one. Amen. <laughs> it's different when you have the matter. Last week Jesus quenched a thirst the woman didn't know she had. This week Jesus invites us to have him smeared into our eyes that our perception might be healed so that we can see. Amen? But our, our story doesn't end here. The miracle requires a response. Now this is where it's going to get heavy, so you might want to buckle up your seatbelts. Amen? With heavenly DNA smeared into his eyes, Jesus tells the man that step two is to go to the pool of Siloam, to the place called Scent, and wash. Now, if we hear that, we're, thinking, we're still thinking the man is the recipient of this miracle. But Jesus is saying he can't just hold the miracle himself. The pool represents a place of community where you're connected at a level that you cannot sustain by yourself. Do you realize when you enter into the or- to a church, you're going to enter in in phases? That's called the narthex. The narthex is the place of preparation. That everybody, you can look back, guys. You don't have to look at me. It's that little square space right there where the fans are kept. Josh is back there guarding the doors. The narthex. That's the outer court. And then you enter into the, the inner court. The, the inner court is the place of washing and preparation, the place of baptismo, the place of baptism. See, if you go through the narthex and you don't get your mind right to go into the inner court, you're going to sit in the inner court with an outer court perception and you're going to misperceive the holy of holies. (laughs) Uh, Well, I was baptized in 1985. You still got to wash. How many times do we walk in here on Sunday morning and we fail to go by the baptismal font and remind ourselves, I mean, I want to just dive in here again because I'm so dirty. I want to just wash again. Amen? Amen? but we just walk right past. But this is a place of perception. Seeing differently. Three phases. I'm interpreting data differently as I come in. I'm hearing the message differently as I come in. My server is getting upgraded as I come in. What does this washing represent? It means to be baptized, to be dipped into Jesus, and you lose your individual self, and you're resurrected into a collective self that can overcome blindness or any other struggle you may have. (laughs) Baptism represents vision. After this man was made new, now we're all excited about his miracle, but the folks that knew him, they weren't so thrilled. Because, because here's the problem with messed up folks. Once, pers- once one person is not messed up uh, anymore, then everybody else realizes they're still messed up. <laughs> See, you're, when you're around sick people, one person gets healed, they start to act differently. And then it judges all the people who want to stay sick. And then, and then the sick community is no longer this peaceful place where we're all just dysfunctional. Now there's somebody who's a benchmark for what it means to be mentally well. The question was, <laughs> wasn't whether or not the miracle even happened. They knew the miracle happened. It was, is this even the same person? Oh, see, oh, see. When somebody walks up to you and says, are you still the same person, Grable? The grable I knew would have never done this. Are you the same person, Father Phil? The Father Phil I knew would never get upset over this. Are you the same person, Deacon Damien? The Deacon Damien I know, he would never get upset over this. But now what wasn't a big deal before you were changed is now a big deal once you're changed. Not everybody's going to be enthusiastic about your new you. Some sick people refuse to see healing even when it's right in front of us. 
And if I walk over and try and unlock the cell, the prison cell they've lived in their entire life, and tell them to walk out freely, there's about 50% of the people that will want to stay in the prison cell because the only life they've ever known is being inside the prison cell. Outside of the prison is a, is a new experience for them, and it may not be comfortable. Some of us, uh, we're trying to get help, but some of us don't want help. Amen? Oh, I mean... See, the Lord, if I had a cure right now for whatever is ailing you, and I say it can go away like this, but you've only known yourself to have that ailment. You've built your house to accommodate your dysfunction. I no longer need the rent for my wheelchair, but my house has been completely redefined for whatever my struggle and challenges. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things, but what I'm saying is when we can to choose to get up and walk, we have to choose to. Amen? People prefer for things to remain the same. Don't be surprised when people have a negative reaction to your transformation. <laughs> Many people have a vested interest in keeping other people blind. Oh, man, I, I, I shouldn't have put a, that in the notes. See, many people have a vested interest in keeping people tied up. Because as long as you're tied up, I don't, I don't have to go back to school because you already, your vocabulary is already so small. But you go back to school and you start challenging your mentor and they realize i got to figure out what some of this stuff means. Then they're going to have to do their own studying and start figuring out, I, got, I better start building my own strength in the spirit. Because somebody's coming up behind me that's stronger than me. The greatest sin ever committed wasn't the sin of omission. And man, this is, we're closing. Omission means I didn't do what I was supposed to do. How many of you ever thought that was the greatest sin? We, I didn't give the man the money I was supposed to give him at the corner. I didn't feed the person I saw. I didn't help the person when they needed it. That's not the greatest sin. The greatest sin is also not the sin of commission. What we did and we shouldn't have done. Watching that channel, doing this, doing that. That's not the biggest sin. The biggest sin is the sin of satisfaction. The biggest sin is the sin of complacency. We tell ourselves, I can't write that book. I can't get the degree. I can't change careers and pursue my passions. I can't be the number one realtor in the state of Colorado. I can't be the number one bus driver in the state of Colorado. I can't be the best window washer and have a thousand employees in the state of Colorado. I can't do, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. When all along God is saying, yes, you can. Just go out and give it a try. We got three amens on that one, amen? When crazy is the norm, sanity seems crazy. The man's response, and this is, this is, this is incredible, is ego I me. We talked about that earlier. This idea of, of I am. Jesus said ego I, ego I me, the bread of life. Ego I me, the good shepherd. Ego I me harkens back to the book of Exodus when Moses asked God, who are you? And God responds with ego I me. Ego, I me. The man didn't just become a better version of himself. The man became Christ and would walk forward and heal others just the same way he was healed by our Lord. Amen. So listen, it isn't about recycling theology and becoming a better version of you. It's about a demolition process of who we thought we were and a resurrection of who he is and a representation or a representation to him to the world who needs him. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet with me, beloved. This is our Lenten journey. The early church valued senses on five levels because they were dealing with senses too. They were dealing, but their number one sense was the, everybody point to your eyes, was the sight. They valued sight the most. That's why they created what's called the beatific vision, the beautiful sight of heaven on earth. So when you look and you say, do we need all those beads on the altar? Do we really need a gold chalice? Do we really need a $6,000 rug? Do we really need all this stuff we have? Well, here's the reality. Do you want, the question is, do you want to see him or not? They hate it. And there's a whole generation blind to the Holy Eucharist. They were born that way. Do we really need all of this? 
the beatific vision, and they went a step further in the early church because they stained the color of the glass. They wanted to transform the, the color of light entering into the room. They wanted to transform the way you were experiencing worship completely so that when you were sitting in a worship environment, you were no longer on earth. You were now in heaven on earth experiencing heaven. And that's how the beatific vision was created. So it's, I'm not surprised that someone walked away and said that my favorite thing about the worship service was the fans. Can you bring me one of the fans? Deacon Damien, go ahead and bring the other one. We're going to take two more minutes. Yeah, the Old Testament. Let's go back. <laughs> Amen. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Everybody do this with me. Say rewind. All right, go ahead and put the, the fans over the altar. All right, now, cherubim, seraphim, they meet in the middle of the altar. This entire thing represents the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the place of mercy. It was called the mercy seat. In the Old Testament, you could not just walk up and kiss the mercy seat. In fact, the mercy seat stumbled over one time. A guy tried to steady it, and he ended up dying because God says, don't touch me unless I authorize you to do so. The cherubim, the seraphim are now over the place of mercy, and the priest stands as Christ to dispense mercy to everybody who comes to receive the holy body and blood of our Lord. Another, another less glorious translation is a lot of the liturgical services in the eastern part of the world happened outside. So there was flies on the body and on the blood, and so they had to have fly swatters. And so they would move the fans around to keep the flies off the communion. That's a whole lot less glorious interpretation. But that was part of the development of the fans. Amen? Oh, see. I bet that's something you didn't know. Raise your hand if you didn't know that. Uh, see? I mean, see, every now and then, these are, these are Holy Ghost flash waters right here just making it happen. So, so people get intimidated. What are all the bells? Do we really need those? Sure we do, because when they start to ring, the angels are flapping their wings. And we have to go back and say, I kind of remember back when we used to... Hear the angels flap their wings. My memory is now activated at a level it wasn't activated before. But if there's no fans, our memory is not recalled. Uh, it's a total recall. Amen? It's a total recall. Do you remember? Before we got here, this was how we lived. Oh, see? That's why young people, they're more, they're more hip to this than the old people are. Because they're, they're closer to remembering what it used to be like before we ever took on matter. Because once we took on matter, things got complicated. Babies smile, we're baptizing them. I was over there, we were pouring the holy water. I saw eye, eyelashes, skin. I was like, Lord Jesus, we done, we've been poured this over so many babies now that there's all kinds of elements here. <laughs> you couldn't create this, this pool of, of it's kind of scary, but you guys can put the fans down. But I want you to see the picture of the beatific vision. If you don't realize that when you walk into the cathedral downtown, they've worked really hard to help you experience heaven without saying a word. When you fly to Greece and you sit in one of those cathedrals and you see those lions in the front of the cathedral protecting from the demons coming in and they're guarding and they're holding posture, they've, they've worked really hard to create a beatific vision for you. So it's sight, next point to your ears, sound. The early church valued sound, next. Sight, sound. Number three was smell, touch your nose. And those of you, all my, all my uh, charismatic and Protestant brothers and friends watching right now, you just X out which ones of these maybe your church isn't, isn't, isn't doing right now. Because I'm going to tell you, an Armani suit is not a beatific vision. The best cologne you can buy is not going to be the same as this incense. Amen? Sight, sound, smell. Now, number four, touch your mouth. Taste was the fourth most valued in the early church. It wasn't devalued, but it wasn't as high as sight. And the lowest form of communicating with God during a service like this was touch. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Touch was, was associated with sexuality, so it was least valued by the early church. They weren't huggers. 
Plus, you had people in the same room who, whose uh, tribes may have been warring against each other for, ge- for generations. And they left their swords in the narthex so they could all worship together in the place of heaven. Amen? And the procession, and we're going to stop because it's 1104. But I'm going to call Father up. Uh, we'll, we'll keep going next, you know, tune in the third Sunday next month. You'll get a, another history lesson. You might be asleep. But it's okay. It, it excites me because, you know, if we're doing a whole lot of stuff and we don't know why, you Come can on, be doing Father. a whole lot and not know why. Then you know what? You know what's going to happen if, if Ezra, these young people don't know why we do what we do? When we die, they're not going to do it. Right. So we have to work really hard so that you can go up and you can defend they say, well, why do we have incense? You can say, well, the early church valued at number three. Amen? Amen. Father, I love you. Amen. Now, you, you see why I have him do this more regularly. We need to know why we do what we do. See, you take all this away, all you got left is a prayer. Ancient churches don't pray the sinner's prayer. Because mud, the salve, is a different experience than the intellect. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with confessing Jesus as Lord and all this stuff, but salvation is much deeper than that. While you're standing, Father's going to do the table, and he may... We'll get, no, not yet. I want to read something to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you who knew all the books of the Bible when you were 10. Woe to you who are trained academically and historically for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish but inside they are full of extortion and full of self-indulgence he said your religion is self-serving you only serve God so you can go to heaven so he's saying what benefits you you know what he calls them? Blind guides. You're blind. Full of dead man's bones. Whitewashed tombs. So you know what a gift God has given the church at Hidden Lake? What he has given St. Isaac's, the Christian Orthodox Church of America? He's given us a chance to present to another generation. You know what the Antichrist is? It's anti-light. Antichrist is not Gorbachev or somebody coming out of Russia or Ukraine. It's Antichrist. It's the Antichrist movement. It's the anti-light movement. The anti-uncreated light movement. There are many, many... Well, how do I know if I'm light or not are you negative when you're constantly in negativity and darkness uncreated light amen amen let's profess our faith in almighty god as father comes we believe in one god the father almighty believe in one lord jesus christ